Okay, moving on. Now that we've got our vector calculus well in hand, let's apply these using the continuity to the continuity and momentum equation. Which is sections 2.4 to 2.6 in your textbook. Let's start with mass conservation, or the continuity equation. If we have some control volume, has some mass in it, m sub cv, some mass is leaving, m dot out, some mass is coming in, m dot in, and that's the boundaries of our control volume. Then mass conservation simply says, basically, that mass can't be created or destroyed. So the time rate of change of mass in the control volume is equal to the difference between the inflow and outflow. Equally as important is how to determine how the mass flow on one of these boundaries is related to other characteristics. And what we get is that the mass flow rate across the boundary is equal to the density on that boundary, the normal velocity and the area of that boundary. This is very intuitive and makes sense if you think about it. Rho V is has units of mass flow rate per unit area. You multiply this by an area and you get a mass flow rate. Now this assumes that you have uniform conditions crossing the boundary or that rho and v are average representative values. But for the purposes that we'll be looking at in this course, typically this is a good enough way of looking at uh, mass flow rates. Now if we take this control volume and we shrink it down to infinitesimal size, then we end up with a differential equation which simply says that the time rate of change of density plus the divergence of the density times the velocity must be zero. So again, this is how much this density times velocity field is expanding away or contracting in to a point, and that simply must be balanced by the time rate of change of the density at that point. Very intuitive. Now, on to the momentum equation, and you'll spend a, quite a bit of time talking about this in your fluids course, so I won't spend a lot of time on it here, but basically this just comes from Newton's second law. Which we're used to thinking of as F equals MA, but really it's F equals D by DT of momentum. Force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum. Now if you have constant mass, this reduces to F equals MA. So if we look at, say, in a Cartesian system at just the x-coordinate of this, what this tells us is that d by dt of rho u plus the divergence of rho times u, where u is the x velocity component, of, uh, times v is equal to the x force on the control volume. Now, 
this sum of two terms is a different way of looking at a derivative and it comes from having the perspective of looking at six points in space instead of six pieces in mass. And you will have learned about this in your second year fluids when you talked about the Reynolds transport theorem. So this is the perspective we're always going to use here. And so in general, we can write this equation as d rho v for the first specific component. We can write it as a single vector equation for the entire field. v dot grad rho v equals the force on the control volume. Now, for a fluid, these forces we can further relate to some other things like the pressure field and viscous effects as well as body forces. Um, the most common example of a body force, which is just a force that scales with the amount of mass you're considering, is gravity. Also electromagnetic forces are body forces. So for a fluid, we get Navier-Stokes equation, which is just a vector equation that is an expression of Newton's second law for a fluid. So this is d of rho v by dt plus v dot grad of rho v and that equals negative grad p pressure gradient plus density times body forces like gravity plus viscous forces. And as a final topic for today's lecture, I want to briefly mention something that is very useful when we're dealing with incompressible fluids which is Bernoulli's equation. So you'll recall that the simplest way of writing Bernoulli's equation is that in the absence of gravitational forces, which typically are not important, for aerodynamic flows, p plus one half rho v squared equals constant. Where is a constant along a streamline in general? And that's for steady, inviscid, incompressible flow. But what about between streamlines? Can we ever apply the Bernoulli equation across or between streamlines? The answer is, and we'll discuss this in more detail next time, only if the flow is irrotational. We'll define this very soon. But to get you thinking about what that means, I'm just going to sketch a simple flow situation here. And we can think about where the flow is rotational and where it's irrotational. So if we have a duct and half of it has higher velocity at inlet and 
half has a lower velocity. So that up here, there's a total pressure. And here we're going to use total or stagnation pressure for this constant. P plus 1 half rho V squared equals Vt. Again, this is incompre for incompressible flow. So here we have some Pt top and here some Pt bottom. And here's another velocity profile that's uniform. And on the left, Pt top does not equal Pt bottom. And on the right, Pt top does equal Pt bottom. And this has to do with whether the flow is irritational or not. And we'll discuss this more next time and in class. So this is a reminder that Pt, this is the stagnation pressure. And we use the term stagnation pressure because as you can see from the definition here, if the velocity goes to zero, then the pressure just becomes the stagnation pressure. So the definition of stagnation pressure is the pressure you obtain if the flow is decelerated to zero velocity.